Welcome to the OrthoClips podcast series where we're going to discuss the latest hot topics and high impact papers in orthopedic surgery. I'm your host, Saqib Rahman. Let's get this episode started. All right, let's get into episode three of this season. We're going to be talking about young adults with femoral neck fractures, recent data from the Young Femoral Neck Fracture Working Group. We're going to be looking at three papers that were published in the August 2024 Journal of Orthopedic Trauma. Uh, The first paper is entitled Optimal Fixation Strategies for Displaced Femoral Neck Fractures in Patients 18 to 59 Years of Age, an analysis of 565 cases treated at 26 level one trauma centers, and the lead author is Tom Roser. The second paper is entitled Femoral Neck Fractures with Associated Ipsilateral Femoral Shaft Fractures, so neck shaft fractures in young adults less than 50 years old, multicenter comparison of 80 cases versus isolated femoral neck fractures. And the lead author is Griffin Rector. And the third paper is entitled Treatment Failure After Repair of Displaced Femoral Neck Fractures in Patients Compared by Decade of Life, an analysis of 565 cases in adults less than 60 years of age. Lead author is Corey Collinge. So these are three papers essentially from the same working group, all published back to back to back in that August 2024 um, issue. So uh, take a look at that. The um, main overview I want to go over is, you know, the the one paper focuses on the uh, femoral neck fractures with associated ipsilateral femoral shaft fractures. The other one talks about optimal fixation strategies. And the third one looks at um, failure rates based on decades of life. So what are some of the key findings? Well, interestingly, associated femoral neck fractures, the neck shaft fractures, seem to have a better prognosis in this study than isolated femoral neck fractures. Uh, Why is that? Not totally sure. Uh, Despite the added complexity of treating both femoral neck and shaft fractures, it seemed that patients with the uh, combined injuries had lower rates of treatment failure, Uh, maybe because the shaft fracture dissipates some of the force from the injury. Um, You know, some of those femoral neck fractures tend to be a little bit less displaced. Um, than when you get an isolated one, perhaps. Another key finding, fixed angle constructs outperform multiple cannulated screws for displaced femoral neck fractures. Well, of course, of course they do, right? Think about this. You have a, dis- you have a displaced femoral neck fracture in a young patient. Their life, th- it depends on it. If they have a failure, they're going to be disabled, and you're going to just throw some darts at it. Like, would you do that for... A tibia plateau fracture. I mean, maybe a Schatzker one with good bone. Do we do that for distal radius fractures? I mean, rarely. Uh, do you do it for distal femur fracture? Yet you got somebody with a femoral neck fracture, and we just throw some screws in there. Of course, femoral, of course, fixed angle devices are going to do better. And it's a little more nuanced than that. I mean, there still has to be some sliding. There still has to be some controlled collapse or shortening, so to speak, to allow for compression. But what they found was that fixed angle devices, particularly those augmented with an anti-rotational screw, had significantly lower failure rates. They also talked about the medial buttress plating, lower failure rates than uh, multiple cannulated screws. So stronger fixation, fixed angle fixation is crucial for success with these uh, fractures. Another key point they found was that treatment failure rates increase with age, even in these younger adults. So as you go through each decade of life, failure rates increased about 10% from age 30 to 40 to 50 to 60. So age, you do have to take into consideration. It's one of the things to influence your treatment decisions. Another interesting point they came up with was this shelf sign. You'll have to dig into the paper a little bit to see this, but it's a specific radiographic feature seen in some femoral neck fractures, more commonly with the neck shaft fractures, and was associated with a lower rate of treatment failure, so maybe better prognosis when you see it. And another thing they talked about, which is so important, is that technical errors are common. I mean, these are hard fractures. Uh, A lot of people are not comfortable with getting the reductions, and they require attention to detail. And unfortunately, you know, what you're dealing with is a cortical fracture that's bathed in synovial fluid. 
So there's not a lot of room for error. You're not going to just get this big, huge callus ball. You really have to get bone-to-bone contact for these things to heal. And, and this is where you know, timing of surgery maybe isn't super critical. It's important, but the reduction is more important. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, AI hosts. I think they do a great job with this one. We keep fine-tuning the prompts a little bit, and uh, you're going to like this one. Right. Um, three papers you sent my way. Yeah. All from the August Journal of Orthopedic Trauma. Yeah. And looks like they're all from this uh, young adult femoral neck fracture working group. That's right. So they're really uh, trying to get a handle on these these tough cases. Yeah, they're really tough. We're talking femoral neck fractures, uh, patients under 60. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the age where, uh, you know, arthroplasty versus repair. It's a real... It's a tough decision. It's a real tough decision. It is, yeah. So this first one here jumps right into it, uh, and they're comparing uh, patients with femoral neck fractures. Right. Who also have uh, an ipsilateral femoral shaft fracture. Yep. Now, you would think that that would be like a guaranteed trip to to disaster town. Yeah, you would think so, right? Yeah. But um, this is where things get interesting. Okay. They found that these associated femoral neck fractures, or ASOC FNFs as they call them, actually had better outcomes than isolated femoral neck fractures. Yep. Uh, 20% failure rate for the ASOC FNFs compared to Almost double that, 49% for the ISIL FNFs. So so adding a femoral shaft fracture to the yeah. mix mm-hmm. somehow makes it more stable. How does that? I know. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, they dug into the details a bit. Okay. The the patients with the ASAC FNFs tended to be a bit younger. Okay. And, and interestingly, heavier. Oh, heavier. Okay. And the fracture patterns themselves were also different. Okay. The ASAC FNFs were more often displaced. Mm-hmm. And had that more vertical orientation, okay. like a pulse type three. Right, pulse type three. So right. you're talking high energy, you know, exactly, almost shearing the femoral head straight off. Exactly, high energy mechanism. So you'd think that that would be. You would think that would be inherently unstable. Unstable, yeah. But there might be something about that specific morphology, or maybe the way the forces are dissipated through yeah. both fractures. Right, right. That actually ends up being more stable. And now. Here's something else that caught my eye. Okay. They talk about this shelf sign. Shelf sign, okay. That was seen on the x-rays of about 54% of the ASOC FNFs. Okay. It's this horizontal sliver of bone. And get this. Okay. Those with a visible shelf sign had a failure rate of just 12%. 12%, wow. Yeah. Shelf sign, okay. Yeah. So help me picture this. Is it it like like a little ledge or bone? Yeah, like a little ledge, like a little setting out yeah a little buttress almost okay okay um and do they have any theories on why that would be so protective you know they don't really delve too deep into the biomechanics of it okay but uh you know you can imagine it might act as a sort of a buttress yeah yeah providing some extra stability okay uh to the fracture site it's definitely something worth paying attention to absolutely in our own patients now could the surgical approach have played a role oh that's a good point I mean, you know, a shaft fracture. Right. Kind of forces your hand. You're going to need an open reduction. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. They they did note that surgeons were more likely to use open reduction and fixed angle implants oh, what? for the ASAC FNFs. Okay. So, yes, surgical technique could definitely be a factor. Yeah. Speaking of which, the second paper really delves into the impact of age. Okay. And perhaps more importantly, yeah. how our surgical choices okay. seem to shift as patients get older. Now, how did how did age affect outcomes? I'm guessing not in a good way. Unfortunately, no, not in a good way. Yeah. Um, they divided the patients into age groups by decade, from I... under 30 all the way up to 50 to 59. Okay. And what they found is that the failure rate climbed with each decade. Okay. In the youngest group, it was 36%, which is still concerning. Yeah. But by the time you get to the 50s, that jumps to 57%. Wow. Yeah. That's a huge difference. What's driving that increase? Right. Is it just the bone quality or is there something else going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They found that the types of failures shifted as well. Oh, okay. Osteonecrosis became a bigger issue with each decade. Right. As you might expect. As you get older. But uh, non-union and failed fixation also trended upwards. So it's not just the bone itself. Right. But maybe also how we're approaching it. Exactly. When they get older. Right. And what's really interesting is that they observed a shift in surgical approach as patients got older. Yeah. The younger patients were much more likely to get 
open reduction and fixed angle implants. Okay. While the older patients were more often treated with multiple cannulated screws. So are we are we consciously or not? Yeah. Are we becoming less aggressive? It makes you wonder. As they get older, is that is that a bias? It's definitely worth considering. Yeah. Is it a matter of surgeon preference? Yes. Or are we perceiving older patients as having a lower threshold for complications? Yeah. Are we underestimating their potential for rebuttery? Yeah. That's that's a lot to unpack. It is, yeah. I'm sensing a theme here. Yeah. There's more to these fractures than meets the eye. It seems like it. And and our assumptions about age right. and stability yeah. might be leading us down the wrong path. I think you're spot on. Yeah. These papers are challenging us to think differently about how we approach young adult femoral neck fractures. Okay. And this is just the first two papers. The third one really dives into something. Right. We all know. Yeah. But sometimes we forget in the heat of the moment. Okay. The the critical importance of meticulous technique. Okay, let's let's hear it. All right. What what do they have to say about uh, technical errors? So they went back and uh, analyzed a whole bunch of cases, okay. looking specifically at technical errors okay. during surgery right. and how those errors correlated with outcomes. Okay. And what they found is that technical errors, even seemingly minor ones, yeah. were a significant factor in failures across, the across all age groups. Yeah. So it's not just about picking the right implant right. or being, you know, it, more yeah. aggressive. It's 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 about being meticulous. It's about the details. Every step of the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They emphasize that these are complex fractures mm -hmm. and even small deviations right. from ideal technique yeah. can have big consequences down the line. Yeah. I mean, think about things like screw placement, yeah. reduction accuracy, mm. achieving that perfect tip apex distance. It's easy to get caught up in the big picture. Right, exactly. And forget about the... Especially when you're dealing with a multi-fragmentary fracture yeah. or a difficult reduction. Yeah. But this paper is a good reminder that those details really matter. The details really do matter, yeah. They do. Yeah. And the consequences of those errors can be significant. Right. Especially in these younger patients. Oh, yeah. We're not just talking about a few months of discomfort. Yeah. We're talking about the potential for a vascular necrosis, non-union, chronic pain, mm -hmm. the need for revision surgery. And potentially decades of disability. Exactly. For these patients. So it really raises the stakes. It does. Yeah. Which brings us back to that question of surgical approach. Right. If we're seeing higher failure rates in older patients mm -hmm. who are also less likely to get open reduction and fixed angle fixation, right. is that because those implants are inherently better okay. at mitigating the impact of minor technical errors? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? It does. Are we sometimes choosing a less stable construct? Yeah. Because we think, oh, this patient's older. Right. They can't tolerate a bigger procedure. Right. Exactly. Or maybe we're less confident in our ability yeah. to, to get that fixation yeah. in, in somebody with... With poor bone quality. Yeah. With not as good bone. Yeah. Those are all valid questions. They are. And honestly, I don't think these papers give us definitive answers, but... Uh, they certainly raise some important points that we need to be thinking about. For sure. They highlight the need for more research uh -huh. to determine the optimal approach for different patient subgroups. Yeah. Should we be pushing for more fixed angle fixation in older patients? Yeah. Even if it means a more technically demanding procedure, mm -hmm. or are there other factors beyond just the implant choice right. that are contributing to these higher failure rates? We've talked a lot about age. Yeah. We've talked about implants. Right. But, but what about this shelf sign right. that they described in the first paper? Yeah. You mentioned that it could be a marker of stability. Yeah, absolutely. So, so could that factor into our decision making? I think it definitely could. Yeah. If we can confirm that the presence of a shelf sign okay. truly correlates with better outcomes, yeah. that could be a game changer. Yeah. It might encourage us to consider repair in patients who we might otherwise yeah. have defaulted to arthroplasty, or it could influence our choice of implant even within the realm of fixation options. So you might say, well, I see a shelf sign. Yeah. Maybe I'll go with something a little less rigid. Yeah, a little less rigid. Because I know that the fracture itself is more stable. Exactly. Yeah. It could add a whole new layer of nuance to our preoperative planning. For sure. 
of, of course, we need more research to yeah. validate its predictive value. Yeah. But it's a fascinating finding yeah. that I'll definitely be looking for in my own patients from now on. These papers have certainly given us a lot to think about. They have. I'm, I'm already kind of questioned yeah. some of my own assumptions yeah. about young adult femoral neck fractures. Mm -hmm. It's clear that age plays a role. It does. But it's not the whole story. Right. And we can't let it dictate our surgical approach exactly. without considering all these other factors, right? Right. Fracture pattern, bone quality, mm -hmm. the shelf sign. And of course, our own technical precision. Absolutely. At every yeah. step of the way. At every step of the way. It's a complex problem with no easy answers. Right. But um, these papers provide valuable insights yeah. and highlight the areas where we need to focus our attention going forward. All right. So we've we've covered a lot of ground here. Yeah. Uh, you know, from the surprising stability right. of associated femoral neck fractures mm. to, you know, the lurking danger yes. of these technical errors. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest takeaway? You know, I think the overarching message yeah. is that we need to approach these young adult femoral neck fractures with a healthy dose of humility. OK. We need to recognize that our assumptions can sometimes lead us astray. And we need to be constantly striving to refine our techniques yeah. and expand our understanding of these challenging injuries. It's a good reminder that we're all lifelong learners in this field. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what makes it so rewarding. For sure, yeah. Yeah, it really is. It's it's amazing. Um, yeah. You know, you think we would have figured these out by now. You'd think so. But uh, clearly we're still learning. Yeah. Definitely. And it makes you wonder what else is out there. Right. I think there's there's a lot of potential in the realm of biologics. Oh, okay. And how they might influence fracture healing. Yeah, okay. You know, we're already using things like BMPs in some cases, mm -hmm. but uh there's there's so much more we could explore. Yeah, imagine if we could uh identify like specific biomarkers. Oh, wow. You know that predict yeah. who's going to heal, uh, who's at risk for complications. That would that would change everything, wouldn't it? That would change everything, yeah. Yeah. Completely change our approach. Absolutely. We could tailor our treatments more effectively. Right. Maybe even develop personalized therapies to enhance bone healing. Wow. And and that's not even get into the potential of things like stem cell therapy. Right, right. Or, or gene editing. It's it's incredible to think about the possibilities. It is. But it all starts with uh research like these papers. Yeah. Absolutely. This young adult femoral neck fracture working group. They're doing great work. They're doing good stuff. Yeah. Uh, bringing these issues to light. Yeah. Getting the data out there so we can, you know. And and stimulate more and research. Move the field forward. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So where do we go from here? Right. What are, what are some of the key questions? Well, I think for me, it's all about refining our understanding of those gray areas. Okay. How do we make those tough decisions between yeah. repair and arthroplasty, okay. especially in those middle-aged patients where the data is still, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of murky? Murky, yeah. Um, how do we account for factors like bone quality, the right. presence of that shelf sign mm. when choosing our implants and surgical approach. Right, right. And how do we ensure that we're consistently achieving that level of technical precision that we know is so critical for success? Those are great questions. Yeah. And I think uh, they all kind of point back to that need for, mm. you know, continued research, collaboration. Absolutely. Lifelong learning. It never ends. It never ends. Well, nope. I think we've uh, thoroughly explored these papers. No, I think so uncovered some some real gems of knowledge here we did yeah i really appreciate you taking the time my pleasure to to dive into this with me yeah always happy to talk about these cases always a pleasure and to our listeners yeah uh thanks for joining us for uh, another deep dive mm -hmm. we hope you found this discussion helpful yeah uh you know as you navigate the complexities yeah of of these young adult femoral neck fractures right um you know, every case is unique. It is. And these papers are just, you know. One piece of the puzzle. One piece of the puzzle. So yep. keep learning, keep questioning. Absolutely. Keep striving for excellence in all you do. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Well, we'll see you next time.